And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have two newcomers to the temple. The double-headed monster that is Drinking Horn Games, composing of Nick Porter and Dominic De Duoni. I'm hoping I got that one right. It's pretty close. Mm -hmm. um, creators of Sagas of Midgard and the upcoming Terrors and Tommy Guns. See? How are you two doing today? Doing doing great. Thanks for thanks for having us here at the uh, the monastery. Mm -hmm. As you yep. said. Yep. I guess I should have gotten my mead ready. Um <laughs> yeah, and to clarify because people can hear but not see us, uh, I am Nick and the other person talking who is not I am Dominic. Show is Dominic. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, let me get the obvious let me get my obvious joke out of the way. Who's the abbot and who's the Costello? <clears throat> um right, Nick, I'll let you call this one. I wasn't. I, I I didn't know that was the obvious question, but uh, let's, I think I'll I'll take Abbott. <laughs> I think I think that's reasonable. Yeah, he, he's the better looking guy, and I'm I'm much more handsome than Dom, if I say so myself. <laughs> oh boy, oh. here we go. All right, I can't uh, actually gonna... back that up. Dom is fiendishly <laughs> handsome. We're gonna go that. We're gonna go that route already, huh? Okay. <laughs> I mean, I, I was we had promised the people a shit show. <laughs> I was a shit show and an open bar. Dom and I have been to many of those, and it, mm -hmm. it often ends with us yelling at each other. So, well, that, well, then, well, look, when, whenever, whenever I've had um, um, any any sort of any sort of pairs of people wor working on a project um, come onto the show, that's the question I always end up asking. Um, if I have three people at once, maybe I'll consider asking um, who who's Larry, Moe, and Curly. <laughs> Yeah, you could also do the Marx Brothers. Um, if I do the Marx Brothers, we're going to be arguing all week. <laughs> uh, fair point. <laughs> um, but it's a bit of a tradition to open with the humble beginnings, in a sense. So with that in mind, walk me through your um, first introduction to role-playing games, and what was it that made it stick for you? Um, for me, I actually started by watching my older brother and his friends play second edition D and D in our basement. Mm -hmm. I, I was four years younger. I was not allowed to speak or interrupt or do anything but sit silently in the corner. It seemed like they were having a really good time, so I was able to get a couple of friends together when I was fourteen. And yeah, do second edition D and D, which was a real disaster if you remember it. Um, and the thing that always stuck with me was just how open-ended it was, especially compared to like the video games of the late 90s, early 2000s. A lot of them were very restrictive in what you could and couldn't do, and what you could and couldn't say, and exactly what was going to happen. And the thing that always stuck with me about role-playing games, and that kind of made me fall in love with them, is that it's a chance to tell a story with your friends that is completely of your own making. Mm -hmm. You know, the rules create sort of guidelines and ways to tell the story but at the end of the day you are making something completely unique that nobody has ever made before and you're doing that with hopefully a group of your friends yeah i have a I have a very similar story i mean i i came to it i guess a little bit later than nick did i didn't get to start playing my first tabletop rpgs until early years of college maybe i was like 18 no, I guess maybe seventeen, right before I graduated. But I found uh, I found RPGs kind of late, even. But I found MMO RPGs early on. I found EverQuest when I was in high school, and I thought that shit was just awesome. And then I found out that there was D and D because my sister started playing when she got to college. My older sister. So much like Nick, I found it through an older sibling, and I got to like sit on sit in on some second edition games being run by a really cool DM and got to just like sit there and kind of watch what was going on and then got to finally play in a game with them later. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, it started a lifelong hobby that has been continuing for, you know, last 20 years and has led to these passion projects of wanting to create RPGs myself. Yeah. Now, when, now um, with, with that, in, with that in mind, when it came to, um, 
Before I get, before I get into Sagas of Midgard proper, one question that I'm curious about is: was a good sh was a good chunk of your respective RPG experiences um, rooted in D and D and D and D adjacent stuff, or did you guys end up branching out as time passed? Um, really, we stayed pretty D and D centric. We tried we started branching out into like Shadowrun and a couple other systems as we were realizing that D&D &D didn't have everything we were looking for. But beyond that, when we decided to start creating the RPGs that we did, Sagas of Midgard, and I mean, no, like we, we didn't realize it, I don't think, like how saturated or how many were already out there because we hadn't, we hadn't played them. So um, I think we, that was kind of good in the long run because it kind of kept our ideas for Sagas fresh. Like I don't think we were influenced by too many other, other things. I don't know. Next. Yeah, so, I mean, I, I played Alternity, which was an old TSR game back in the day, but mostly stuck to editions of D&D. &D. And then, like Dom said, we kind of struck out into Shadowrun and the Cypher system and a couple other, um, couple other systems. Really what it came down to and where I think a lot of people kind of, in my opinion at this point, get stuck with D&D &D, is that it's the familiar thing that everybody knows and everybody knows how to play. And as anybody who's ever tried to get an RPG group together knows, it can be really difficult to get people around the table. And so if there's one less barrier to get people to want to show up and play, and that's that they know the system, I think that is a lot of what makes people a little more hesitant to try newer things. Also, back in the day, it was hard to know what other systems were out there and what existed. I mean, now you have drive through RPG, you have itch.io, mm -hmm. you have access to thousands of great systems that I didn't no existed um but yeah and so that where we kind of i think it's almost a, a blessing in a way that we didn't play a lot of different systems because that's what led to us starting to create them was we were looking for a system that we we didn't know if it existed yet and we got drunk and we're eating pizza and drinking beer and said let's just make our own how hard could it be <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's how it started and that was four <laughs> years ago at this point. Um, and, you know, several hundreds of pages and thousands of sales later. Hours. Yeah. Oh, God. Oh, so, um, yeah. How it's many so much work. I have to ask, how many times did, some, did somebody sarcastically say, how hard could it be while furiously typing? <laughs> and, you know, there reaches a point in every project where it's not new anymore, but it's also nowhere near being done. And you just sit there, yeah, and like I, I don't recall having the, uh, the clever mind to think that because I was mostly just a little drained about it. When I'm when you're just staring and you realize you have about a hundred pages left to write before you have a finished book, but you're already a hundred fifty pages in, so you can't stop. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, for I, me, I, the, the worst part was really the tedium at the end of like once all the creative stuff was done. And then it was just like, all right, now we have to do like all the business and like edit the book and format it, lay it out and transfer it all into like, oh my God, that was the, uh, that was for me to like, oh, I just push on, slog, to stop slogging. <laughs> like, like, <laughs> yeah. Given, given that the one thing, the one thing that I was curious about when you mentioned um, largely in largely in the uh, d20 umbrella is now sagas of midgard uses oh, uses either a d10 or or a d100 and yeah. what i'm curious about was what was the reason for going with um that particular die set, die setup given that background why did we decide that um i don't even <laughs> I think um, we, I think we wanted we were just kind of like a base ten system. You know, was was easy. The we were trying to get the I don't know to make the math feel a little simpler or easier to add in your head. And mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah, so like, like a level uh, six monster has a base rollover of sixty, meaning you need to roll over a sixty to succeed at hitting them or whatever. Like we we, yeah, we kind of use that as like our power scaling on like a base ten kind of idea, and then. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. And yeah, the, the idea was we wanted math to be easy because, like I said, we both grew up in the era of Thaco and things that were sort of overly complicated for no reason. And, you know, like there are plenty of systems that are still, in my opinion, kind of overly complicated. So 
we like wanted it to just be uh yeah or <laughs> i mean honestly pathfinder like pathfinder is mm -hmm. a great system but i don't i don't personally like it for the games that i play um so. for for me when for me when it comes to pathfinder i look i look at it as um one one step forward two or three steps back um sure most, mostly because it um there were the actual problems that i had with um d and d third edition um it never really it never it never really solved it just bandaged and yep. you keep a bandage on too long eventually the thing's gonna fall off um yeah, so I think in terms for sagas, I think like Dom said, it was mostly just ultimately ease of access. We wanted the game to feel accessible. Mm -hmm. you know, it's always more fun rolling with friends. So rolling a d20 is cool, but rolling two d10s is cooler. And in Terrors and Tommy Guns, we've gone with a scaled dice pool system. So rolling potentially three or four or five friends is even cooler than that. Yeah. Um, now the thing the thing that I find the thing that I find interesting is. There's a bit of wiring for a lot for a lot of people's heads when they think of a D100 system. They're usually thinking roll low, and you guys ended up going for the high end of the spectrum. Um, when it can, when and the 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 main of the main other one I can think of that goes for a D100 roll high is is stuff like Anima and um, Rollmaster, aka aka um, Chart Hell for some. Um, but getting, getting past that, getting past, um, dice. Now I had first found out about, um, Sagas of Midgard because of my, because of my love of, um, folk metal and wanting to introduce and wanting to do a whole lot more Viking related things with, um, my TRPGs. And what I'm curious about was what, what was it about, um, Norse mythology that struck that struck you to go to say this is this is what we want to build a game around uh really a lot of it came um from wanting to pay just homage to what is essentially like the core of a lot of what we know is high fantasy i mean so much of everything that D D and tolkien and back to yeah tolkien uses is i mean elves and dwarves and trolls and i mean I, all this stuff is just steeped in like norse mythology and, and their lore mm -hmm. and we started reading more and more of it the sagas and the the mythology itself and just you know fell more in love with it i had already read some just on just personally loving history and and that but yeah i mean that was that was most of my inspiration for it and nick yeah um i mean to start it's it's metal as f um <laughs> Like, the thing that I appreciate about a lot of polytheistic traditions, and especially like pre-Christian pagan traditions, things like that, mm -hmm. is that the gods don't really care about you, and you have to prove your worth. And so that comes up a lot in the sagas, and then that also comes up a lot in TTRPGs, where there's the idea that the heroes and the characters and the stories are somehow special. Um, with sagas, we really wanted to make you prove that, right? Like character death is, as we say, it's a feature, not a bug. Um, characters can and will die. We've had some, a very few select characters make it through all of a full campaign. A lot more kind of eat it. And so I like that they idea that you have are to... remembered and they die in epic fashion. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so you get a chance to, um, yeah, sort of tell that story and create an actual saga in the face of gods who grant you power but don't really care if you live or die some of them if they like you will make you die like if you read the valkyries picked who went you know got picked who survived the battle and who went to valhalla and all of that but they picked that often by making people die not by just deciding oh i think you get to go to heaven today there will be, you know, bits of folklore where they think a Valkyrie tripped somebody, so they got stabbed or made their shield miss, things like that. Mm -hmm. So it was just, it was a really cool period. It opened up a lot of player abilities. And as soon as it started reading, the first thing we came up with for Sagas was with Joy I Cease, where any character can sacrifice themselves on their turn to kill basically whatever they're fighting. 
So you always have that ripcord ability where, all right, my character's going to die, but he gets to die like a badass. And what we found was that if death is the expectation, unlike in a system like D&D where it's basically impossible to kill a character, if players kind of go into it knowing that their character is probably going to die, they feel a lot better about giving them up, especially if they get to go out in a really cool way. Yeah. Now, when it now when it came to um, the other thing, of course that of course that I noticed with um, within the within the core rules of um, of sagas of Midgard is the no, is the notion of raiding, and obviously there's obviously raiding is a big was a big thing among Viking cultures, but um, was was that was that something that early on you guys want you guys wanted to in, include as a major pillar? Yeah, for sure. So the idea behind that was a thing that I hated as a GM uh, was getting to the adventure, right? Because mm -hmm. the options are you either kind of cut scene it, you're like, oh, two weeks pass and you get there, and that's boring, or you do the thing where you make your players take watch every night, and there's a random encounter that takes two hours and has no bearing on the plot. And it just, it wasn't that satisfying to me. So we wanted to try to find a way to make sort of an interactive cutscene that helps fuel, like the money you get from raiding helps you uh, power your abilities and helps you upgrade your settlement. So that sort of travel cutscene gets some weight behind it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it just does, it, does its job of getting into the adventure large without like wasting a bunch of time um on random encounters like mick was saying because i don't you know we found especially as we started getting older that you know we try to try to hang out ha hang out and play but like man come 11 o'clock you got to go home and get ready for work the next day but like there's no you know there's not hours and hours and hours to kill anymore like maybe there wasn't our youth so mm -hmm. making a more concise adventure was was on our minds you're making me feel old right now dom yeah well we, we are old bro <laughs> oh, nuts! <laughs> am I gonna have to retitle this? Am I gonna have to retitle this interview, "Grumpy Old Men"? The show. <laughs> I mean, it would probably be more accurate. Yeah, but I'd also <laughs> probably get myself sued, so that's out. <laughs> All right. Well. Um, though it is, though, when it comes now, obvious when it comes to um, when it, when it comes to the no, the notion of ma of making those interludes um important. Um, what, were there any, were there any things that, um, when trying to, when trying to decipher the mechanic of it, that were more, dip, that were more tricky to adopt or something that you really thought would work, um, ended up falling apart in playtesting? For rating specifically? Yeah. Um... I mean, a lot of that was just tweaking the numbers. Um, we had it at certain points where it was both way too easy to fail and also way too easy to succeed. Um, and just, yeah, just kind of figuring out the numbers part of it. Like the bones of it, I think, were always good. But then, yeah, things like how to make sure to involve everybody, like how to make sure, like when can rating skills be repeated? Because, mm -hmm. you know, it's kind of a mini game within, you know, what you normally think of. In, as an RPG. So you want to make sure like anything that one player doesn't railroad it, you know, try to quarterback the whole thing. Uh, you want to make sure that there are challenges that your players are well equipped to handle and challenges that they are not well equipped to handle because they have to, um, they have to find ways around that and be more creative and potentially fail. And frankly, failure in TTRPGs is more memorable because it's usually hilarious. Um, so yeah, I think just kind of working around the, the bones of it were always pretty good, but what play testing brought out were just ways to make people feel engaged and make it feel weighty and interesting. Yeah. Now, when, now I know, I realized that a lot of, a lot of the mechanics, um, within, within Sagas of Midgard are a, ca are a case of you guys kind kind of responding to the games that you had played and wanting to, and wanting to avoid some of their traps and in that re in that regard I'd like to ask a bit about um rune casting now 
it would be very e- was it would be very easy for someone to to look at this and say th- and say this is the magic equivalent, but was a good chunk of the design with rune casting your attempt to try and have ma- magic that wasn't falling into the um, spell slot trap that D and D has? Um, well, really, what what our idea was with that was that we wanted the magic system to be accessible to all the player characters, so it didn't have to be limited to, you know, just a wizard. And it wasn't really... uh, There is one class that you can build that is a little more magical than the rest, I guess, if you go down an Odin uh, path. Mm -hmm. But really, it it was to, to kind of give a magical effect to just about every character that was rolled up and also a way to make usable items, expendable items, like something that you wanted wanted to use and and would use constantly. I think it was more for me trying to end the the uh, the trap that you fall into with your magic items and consumables and a lot of other RPGs where you just end up st- stowing them away and, and never burning them because you're like, I don't know, is this the fight? Should I use it here? I don't know. Mm-hmm. We're doing okay. And then by the end of the adventure, you realize you've got you know three or four potions you haven't used and a bunch of scrolls that have been untapped and um, we were hoping that the runes would just be like a, a burn if you uh, smoke them if you got them kind of burn them as you go. Yeah, so they were they were thematic and they were a way to again with a little bit of character point investment chain magical effects together. So with a little bit of investment because because the runes you find are random, it's hard to find a game breaking combination that breaks the game more than once. So what that does is it creates a system by which, like Dom was saying, you kind of smoke them if you got them. Early in playtesting, he was about to TPK one of his groups. A uh, runesmith character comes up with a really clever way to chain his runes together, saves the party. Like, the players still talk about that, because something that I really appreciate in RPGs is a way to give them consequences. I don't think that a TPK is a good thing, of course, but... This was something that was exciting because using their abilities, they were able to sort of snatch victory from the jaws of defeat. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, like uh, the more traditional what you think of as like magic abilities, magic spells are just in the, uh, the character skills. Uh, we wanted to kind of phase those in for everybody because most of the Norse gods have some magic behind them, you know. Thor is the warrior god, but he's also the storm god. So if you're a Thor build, you can use hammers or you can shoot lightning. Um, so yeah, we wanted rune we wanted rune casting to be sort of an equalizer and something more exciting because of how random it was at the table. Mm-hmm. And in the in in that regard, now it's it would be given the tone, and I'm getting an echo from somebody. It might be me. Is that better? Testing? Testing? Yeah, I'm still hearing it. Try again? Okay, and... Nope, it's gone. Right. Um, now, when it comes to the fact... You guys are doing a, a very... A very brutal game. I think, I think given, the, given the whole uncaring gods and a lot of motifs with um, Norse mythology, this is definitely not one of those um, faint of heart style approaches. Um, and in, the, in, that reg- in that regard, that leads me to combat. Now, a lot of times when, ga- when games try and go for a very um, brutal approach, they tend to go for low health heroes with high damage weapons. Um, but what what were some of the things that you guys want to emphasize to to make clear that brutality and avoid um, certain traps? So we do have, I mean, a lot of the combat on both sides is um, low health and high damage. There is mm-hmm. some healing, but not a ton. Um, so what we were going for with combat was again a way to make things feel kind of exciting, right? You have runes which can equalize a really hard fight. You have with Joy I Cease, which at the cost of a character can equalize a really hard fight. So in chapter five of the Saga's book, I tell people don't worry that much about balancing combat. Like if it's somebody's first raid, don't put them up against Valkyries and Fire Giants. But understand that within reason, 
the dice are are random and players have ways to sort of even the score. Um, so really, again, it's it's understanding that like your character dying in an RPG, especially this RPG, is not the same as a video game where if you die, you lose, right? Mm -hmm. If you die in sagas, you just make another character and your character lives on in glory in Valhalla. So it's not really a loss per se. So yeah, we just, we wanted it to ha to feel weighty and to feel again, like the weapons have impact, but that the enemy's weapons also have impact. Yeah. yeah. And in the in, in to kind to kind of go further into that, do you cons do you consider um, Sagas of Midgard to be a game that favors? Oh, and there there's that echo again. Uh, I think that I don't know. It seems to be what I've come off of. But I was gonna say. About the brutality, um, I think we did a unique job of of helping out there of upping our brutality in the game with the the horde mechanic, mm -hmm. which was something that we threw in as a template for monsters, where you could essentially fight gigantic hordes. I mean, 30, 60, 90 creatures at a time, and basically they shared a hit pool and, and had mechanics for their attacks and how much area they would cover on a battlefield and that kind of thing. But, um, you know, it allowed you to imagine the fight in a different way, right? Like, instead of hacking away at a single guy with a whole lot of hit points and you kind of barely hit him for a lot of rounds, you know, if you do 10, 15 points of damage to a horde, you can imagine you're slicing through multiple goblins. Like, you're, you're cutting apart multiple trolls with one hue of your sword. Mm -hmm. um, but mm -hmm. I think that really, in the, in the mindscape, really like increases the brutality of of what you're imagining because i mean it's all how you describe it so for me that's more satisfying than doing a couple of hit points of damage to a creature mm -hmm. knowing mm -hmm. that like with each swing i might be felling a beast you know yep. also i should i should note that there's a hashtag that i'm trying that i'm trying to that i i shamelessly stole from the against the from the against the dark master devs that i'm trying to push to see how far i can get get it is Make criticals hurt again. Our the crits in our system. Um, if you roll one hundred on a d one hundred twice, you kill whoever you're fighting. If you roll a one on a d one hundred twice, the Valkyries decide you're a better target. Uh, critical criticals, both good and bad, mm -hmm. are ridiculous, and that's on purpose because like. Rolling a 100 twice on a D100 is what, a 1 in 10,000 chance? Yeah. Like, it's, it's happened. How many times has it happened at the table? Weirdly. Yeah. Our yeah. test run campaigns, I mean, shit. That happened twice. That happened in my campaign on the main boss of like the first adventure. That happened on Gorehorn. Oh, and it happened. Him. Yeah. And it happened on Lenny's defense roll. So, like, Lenny just dodged so hard that, like, Gorehorn missed him and slipped on some rocks in the field and dashed <laughs> his own head out. <laughs> and his brains went skittering across the field. <laughs> Hit a jagged rock in a fjord and <laughs> that was it. <laughs> I don't think you had told me that before. That's that's hilarious. Yeah. Yeah, it was uh, it was a fun moment. Um the other th something else I'm curious about is the is the concept of divine gifts as far as far as advancement because you did mention earlier about how the gods don't care and you have to er you have to earn their um, caring and because because of that what was the what was the um inspiration what was the general idea for how the divine gifts um are structured so it's kind of a multi-class system, mm -hmm. right? So the idea is, I mean, character points sort of represent, I guess in some way, the favor bestowed upon you by these Norse deities. So, you know, it's, as you reach higher and higher tiers and continue to raid and not die, it's that sort of thing where, you know, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy where if you haven't died, then you must be favored of Odin or you must be chosen of Tyr. So from a game mechanic standpoint, it was a way to let players advance without tying them to, you know, like a build or one god or two gods, the way that you see with other multi-class systems. Um, like you have to specialize a little if you want to get the most powerful stuff, but 
Yes, from a game mechanic standpoint, that's how it works. And from a thematic standpoint, like I said, if you go, if you survive seven, eight raiding seasons and do all these heroic deeds, then you know that's how you get your character points. Then it stands to reason that at least one of these gods thinks you're okay. Like they don't want to, you know, go have dinner with you, but they don't actively want you dead today. Yeah, you might be useful to them in some way. Uh-huh. And to the, now to that end, what before before we um se- before we segue f- further on into um in into your ne- into your next project, Terra's and Tommy Guns. What I'm curious about is. Is what would you say were some of the big learning experiences post launch that you learned from the development of Sagas of Midgard? Mm. Signing 200 books in a row isn't fun. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. For, for Kickstarter fulfillment, we said that we would um, go ahead and sign every hardcover copy. And that took many, 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 many hours. But well, which meant we had to do the shipping too. Oh well, yeah. Which was fun. So, <laughs> in terms of game <laughs> design and game support, that's my least favorite. Yeah. Um, in terms of the actual game, um, I mean, just kind of figuring out because you know, once we actually got to play the thing, once it was out, like we didn't find anything that was broken, which was nice, but. It was nice to be able to kind of step back and instead of playing the game as a creator trying to find bugs. You're just playing it as a GM trying to have a good time with your friends. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like the book's printed. Like we can change things on a PDF or like send out errata, but basically it's done. So it's just kind of learning to enjoy that and then start thinking about, well, what about this would I change? Because we came to sagas by playing a bunch of other systems outside of D&D and thinking about what we would change. So now we're playing a book of a system that we wrote and thinking, well, how would we do this differently for whatever the next world was? And that's what wound up becoming Terrors and Tommy Guns. And speaking of that, let's go, let's go into that. So how, so how did this sort of thing start out and why did you go with um, what's, what's effectively horror noir? Because I like them both. It's kind of the reason why we chose Vikings. Like they're cool. Mm -hmm. um i my dog is named bogart i'm really into old movies especially old noir um so just started thinking about that but understanding that there are a lot of noir games already on the market also started thinking about uh cosmic horror which has started finding its way back into the cultural consciousness sort of drained of its more problematic issues namely most of hp lovecraft's actual writing so it was trying to sort of marry these two similar but somewhat different worlds. And that's where the idea of the collective or the secret society that all these players are a part of came from, where the, that's sort of your ticket into the cosmic horror part. If you're a regular person, you probably won't know that a lot of this stuff is going on. But if you're a member of the collective, now all of a sudden it it helps open up, well, okay, I was just, you know a private investigator or a beat cop, but now I'm in all this stuff. And I think adding sort of the secret society part of it also helped differentiate it from a lot of the other cosmic horror systems. Now, when it comes, you mentioned, um, when we talked about um, dice with Sagas of Midgard, you mentioned multiple, you mentioned um, doing a multiple dice setup. Um, I'm curious how that's go, how that's, going to go about and where the difference lay between what you're doing with Sagas of Midgard and what you're doing for TNT. Uh, for TNT, I feel like we came up with a pretty pretty cool, dynamic uh, way to get to play with all your dice. I, I really, you know, I always like, thought like a D&D is weird. You just like pick out your damage dice and you pick out your, your D20 and you're good to go. You don't, really don't even touch much of the others a lot of the time. But I wanted to play. I wanted to use them all. We wanted to use them all for this. So we decided on this assets and liability system that we were hoping would be very easy and we think is very intuitive and easy and has been play testing as such. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. to pick up. So basically, you 
you just to determine whatever action you're trying to do and how many assets or liabilities you might have while trying to do it, which is something that the director of the game will help you with. Um, and based, based on your talents and abilities and attributes, whatever you've spent your character points into, you'll be able to um, alter which skills you're good at or whatever. But so you then you then see how many assets you have and you roll a dice pull according to that. So um, you know, if you have two assets to a skill, you'll roll a d20 and you'll add a d4 to it as well. And whatever that is on the, whatever that is, that's, that's your rollover. And you see, um, if you've succeeded or not. Now, was the main reason, was the main reason for going for that approach to kind to kind of divorce the, um, um, attribute skill paradigm that's so, that's so common within role-playing? Yeah, so like if you have, like we do have attributes and skills or some of the things you can put your character points into. Mm -hmm. But yeah, basically what we wanted was no matter what, like you don't have to, you, you have to figure out your assets, right? So like you have, you, you derive however many assets you have. And then the director, which is what we're calling the GM in this system, will say, okay, make this roll with two assets additional and a rollover of 20. So you don't have to look like, oh, what do I get to this? What do I get to this? Add this, add this, subtract this. Um, really, it's just a way to simplify the math at the table um, because the faster you get through all of that, the more time you get to spend doing cool stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so it, it does help divorce it from that a little. Like we do have those things still, but we've sort of taken, I think, the guesswork out of it. Because yeah, like if you have three assets, it's a D8. If you're rolling at two liabilities, it's minus a D6. And we have this in a table and we have this on our character sheet, but it's just a thing that I, yeah, kind of help takes the guesswork out of it. And I think makes things move a little faster. Yeah. Um, has there ever been concern about the dice getting too swingy? I.e. you're either rolling really well or really terribly. Um, well, I think the assets and liability system actually helps with that because it gives a lot of, you know, power to the director where, you know, if, I mean, if things are seeming too easy, you can you can notice some other liabilities that might be in the area. Like, oh, perhaps there's a fog, perhaps there's an uneven terrain or things that might um, that might hinder the players. And conversely, if the players are having a hard time, there's ways that, you know, the enemies might be hindered and they might be given some assets and you know, all that to say, just it gives more power to the director to kind of help in those situations and keep things at a, you know, I think at a, at a level where it's supposed to be to progress the plot. Because a lot of, you know, what we do, what we create in our systems is a way for the rules to facilitate the story that you're trying to tell and to make that, make that happen in a fun, enjoyable way for everybody at the table. Um, and I think the assets and liability system gives that power to a to a director to to kind of do that a little bit. Yeah. I mean, still, of course, yeah. there's random chance of the dice, and sometimes you get a roll of one. But you know, um, that does help. Yeah, and yeah. as far as the dice being swingy, um, I mean, it's a game. Cosmic horror is ultimately about chaos, right? A lot of the stories of elder gods and things like that. They're not actively evil, twirling their mustache. They just don't care or know who you are. And they accidentally destroyed your world while they were getting coffee. So the dice being swingy, like sometimes you do really well. And this is a world with guns and you know cosmic horror monsters. And it's deadly in its own way. But unlike in the Viking game, there's the expectation that if things get hairy, if your players are rolling really badly, they can just run away or find a way out of that fight. Um, and sort of attack the thing from another angle like the way that a lot of the fights have actually gone against the supernatural monsters that we've put into the game not just dudes with bats and guns is the players were actually doing well but they thought they were about to die so they got exactly what they needed as the things were bearing down on them or enemies were shooting at them and they got out and i think that works better for a system where there are tommy guns and monsters trying to suck your soul out of your body so, yeah, sort of a long-winded way of saying, I actually, if it does get swingy, which we haven't seen yet, to me, that's a feature, not a bug. Yeah. Now, I do want to ask a bit about the, about the collective as, a, or, as an organization. Um, 
like when when it comes to when it comes to how or how um how organized or and or how loose they are um obvious obviously pe obviously given the um description of that um people are going to make comparisons to the BPRD in um, Hellboy would that be a fair comparison or are they a little less um organized than that so what I initially took it from was not Hellboy, but the Continental Hotel in John Wick. Oh. Um, I mean, just just being honest, the way that I've sold this game to people is it's Dunwich Horror mixed with Maltese Falcon mixed with John Wick, mm -hmm. where you have people who have a common goal but are not necessarily allies who have one place where they can all meet up and share their knowledge without threat of violence. Um, in terms of sort of allegiance... Again, like not everybody that you're going to meet in the collective is going to be your friend. Um, you know, the rules say that you can't hurt each other while you're on the grounds, but otherwise, like with the Continental Hotel and John Wick, it's a neutral meeting place for a number of different factions. Um, and it is one organization. It is the main organization that acts as an arbiter in New Babylon and in our game world for the supernatural, but it's definitely not the only supernatural organization, if that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. And since you mentioned the Continent since you mentioned the Continental Hotel, oh. um, um which, which get which um which, I'll give I'll give you props for taste on that front. Um yeah. like you in the in those mo in those movies there's always the currency with the um with the gold coins or or with the markers. Um did you was there any point that you had something similar in mind where there was a type of um social currency that they that the collective has that's exclusive to them as a matter of fact that made the cut um we have a secondary currency besides dollars in florins um which so yeah that that is actually exactly that sort of a social currency that can be used both you know, sort of as a means of payment or getting favors, et cetera, et cetera, within the collective. But there are also, it's the closest thing that we'll ever get in any of our games to a magic item store where you can spend florins on some kind of like our answer for runes in this. We call them incantations, just mm -hmm. one, one shot abilities that your character can use to, again, kind of help even the scales. Additionally, most of the stuff you buy with florins are what Dom and I call plot progressment where you reach a point where you're maybe stuck in an investigation or you didn't find the clues you were supposed to, they also act as a sort of player GM currency where they can go to the collective and kind of get the nudge they need in the next direction. Mm -hmm. We've tried to do that, especially considering that, you know, if it's sort of meant to be a mystery game or a game where you're investigating things that are unknown, through no fault of their own, through a bad role, through whatever, a player or a character might miss what they're supposed to be doing. So we have a number of wits, talents, wits is one of our four attributes, and a number of things that you can do at the collective to sort of get you back on track. So you don't spend your entire gaming evening trying to figure out where your GM wants you to go. Mm -hmm. And that's also... that. The other part of that question, obviously, was the no the notion of the marker, which we first saw in the second um, John Wick movie, um, namely the bl the um, black coin that ha that has a fingerprint. Um, that if that is a favor that can't be um, can't be refused. Um, obviously, that I'd imagine that one might be a little bit trickier to implement here, but would it be f um, feasibly possible? Um, I don't see why not. There are plenty of things that can bind people to one another. Um, that is not something that we had directly cribbed yet, but hey, you know, we've got a, we've got some ground between now and launch. So, uh, yeah, we're still writing. Yeah. Yeah. We, we do not have anything specifically to that end, but yeah, there, there is no reason why, like we do have rituals and things like that. Um, because you can't have a good cosmic horror game without cultists and rituals. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, just ways in which you can bind yourself to somebody else, again, whether for good or for ill. Yeah. Um, now, when it now, when it comes to the concept of scars, was this your attempt to have something that was, cl was um, close to um, sanity but not 
t not going on the same, not treading the same ground as Call of Cthulhu. Yeah, I think you know you got to play with the notion of of going crazy against these cosmic terrors. It's a it's a theme in in the genre for sure. But also, I think it's an interesting way to um, add personality traits and to kind of guide role playing a little bit at the table, um, which is something that Nick and I love. We've always loved more the storytelling, the uh, the the RP pr perspective of the game, and um, always trying to influence, you know, increase that whenever we can help out in that area, encourage it at the table, if possible. Yeah, yeah. But right. what I'm what I'm curious yeah. about with how scars are um, presented yeah. is, is there the possibility of if somebody gets too many scars that they'd end up um, losing themselves and becoming a NPC? Yeah. So there is. It's that's um. Every time, for every scar that you have, every now and again in moments of great stress, we have a mechanic called the reality check, where you roll a straight d20. Um, if you roll, if you fail the reality check, then based on your scars, the director has something wacky happen. So there reaches a mathematical point as well as a role playing point where you can never pass a reality check. So right now we have, um, again, something you can do through the collective where you pay your florins, you can go into the dreamscape. And that's this is something that would ideally be done as a full adventure, where mm -hmm. the party goes collectively into their dreams and their scars, etc., and works to overcome them. But it's a means by which you can remove scars to keep your character. But I'm, I'm guessing that doing this isn't cheap. Yeah, so it's it's very expensive, and you actually have to survive the ordeal of going through you know, the, this dreamscape, which can offer very real pain and damage. Um, so you have to sort of survive the adventure as well as have the means to do it in the first place to be successful. And I got that from, there are a lot of different mythologies where you'll see a hero fighting their way out of the underworld, usually to come back to life and fulfill their purpose. That didn't really fit for this system, but I still wanted to draw upon that trope some. So the idea that characters have a way where they can sort of go into their dreams and the darker parts of their realities, sort of their underworld, mm -hmm. and find their way out and be stronger on the other end of it to fulfill their purpose kind of helps fulfill that part of the hero's journey in a genre and a system that doesn't talk about that too much. Yeah. Now, with, now within... Um... Within within characterization in Terrors and Tommy Guns, um, given given what came before, where you had mentioned that the that um, favor kind of acted as your multi classing system, um, do you have do you have a rough equivalent in this to make to make sure that people aren't exactly pigeonholed into thinking that they have to do one specific role? So what with um, in terms of multi-classing, you have your attributes. Like with mm -hmm. sagas, anybody can buy any skill. You might be better or worse at it, but anybody can buy anything. And like with sagas, there aren't enough skill points to go around for you to be good at everything. So you will have to pick and choose. On the other hand, that I think that has helped keep players from min-maxing too much. Um, basically, you can be you can be good at one or two attributes worth of things, and then you can sort of multi-class, as it were, or just buy skills and talents, which are the more specialized player abilities, sort of as you think you'll need them for your character. Mm -hmm. now, when, now, when it comes to the magical end of things, um, you, meant, you, mentioned, or you mentioned earlier incantations that are going to be kind of... Um, kind of one shots the successor to runes effectively but when it comes to when it comes to the bigger end of the magic the macro end of things with with things like rituals and artifacts what were what what did you aim to do that would be um di that would be different and what would you aim to do that would be similar to your uh, previous work Dom, you've been working more on rituals recently. Do you wanna do you wanna go into that one? Um, I mean, if I understand completely, I, I feel like we kind of expanded on 
it, if anything. I mean, previously, you know, Sagas was our first take on things. We came up with the rune system and the rune casting, and that was that was fun. And we kind of, I feel like, did that with the the rituals. Um, mm -hmm. But I feel like, or, or I'm sorry, with the incantations, but I feel like the rituals kind of take it another step further um, and kind of really expand those powers almost into uh, almost what we did with the artifacts in Sagas of Midgard and, and just how powerful they are, but um, are not artifacts. We have artifacts actually in Paris and Tommy Hunt as well. So like I said, I think we kind of just expanded on the magic a bit. Um, I really think in incantations and rituals and we'll just yeah. be able to get more than we were able to do with the rune casting system. Yeah, and rituals also act as, a, again, a sort of a means of plot progression because each one requires a certain number of components. And we, com we describe components as basically being a MacGuffin, right? You need an Eye of Newt and a stone found deep in a well and a Costco executive membership card to cast this ritual. <laughs> well, you have to go get all of those and you can only find them by going on an adventure. Mm -hmm. So... Like we have the component cost of it, and we have what we call an eldritch price, which is something, again, usually scars or character flaws or any other number of things that can happen. Um, that if you want to embrace this great power, it will come probably with a great pain. Um, so it's a way to sort of push the plot forward while allowing players at a price to extract something of great power. And the nice thing about requiring specific components that the GM sort of by definition makes up as they go along mean that if the players are getting to do this thing, it's with the permission of the director, right? Like if you need specialized components that you have to go adventure to find, you're going to get those and be able to do it basically because the GM wanted you to. So it's another way for you both to sort of collaborate and help move a story together. Mm-hmm. And when it comes now, when it comes to um, art, when it comes to artifacts, since that was de since that was delved into, the way, from what I'm looking at the uh, the way that a lot of artifacts are going to work is that they um, they have advantages, disadvantages, and also um, a bit of a personality to them. Yeah, I mean that's something we that's something we did in sagas, and definitely wanted to continue on in this system. Artifacts are probably the most akin to what they were in sagas. We really, um, you know, maybe expand uh, expand the imagination a little bit to include possible, you know, crazy alien tech that might have been ruined and left here forever or some otherworldly, other dimensionally kind of thing. Or, um, you know, whether it's just some kind of like artifact dagger or what, whatever it is, it, more than what would just be allowed from the Norse mythos. Mm -hmm. But it's really the same template. I mean, we kind of kept that the same. Yeah, so yeah. I mean, basically it's the same, again, with sagas and with this, where anything that offers you great power, I want there to be a risk for great pain, right? So it's not just you get the plus five Vorpal Sword and now you're the coolest guy on the block. It's you can choose to take this power, but something else is going to go with it, and there's going to be a role-playing component to it. I think that that helps make it more interesting than, hey, I found this sword and my numbers went up. Also, we currently have written into the game a pair of haunted tap shoes that are an artifact, so that's something you're definitely not going to get with D&D. <laughs> like I, hear, I hear haunted tap shoes, and all I can, all I can think about is the... Um is the fairy tale about the red shoes. I am not familiar of... Um, no, no. A, a, girl goes, a girl goes out to get red shoes in, instead, of, um, instead of going to church so that she, so that she, could, da so that she could dance at the um, festival. And she does get them, and she can dance, but the problem is um, she can't stop. That's actually um, the character Bane, is that you can entrance people, and like Fred Astaire, you can walk on ceilings and walls, mm -hmm. but if you fail a reality check at any point, you dance uncontrollably for one hour. <laughs> 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 Which, in the context of a very serious situation in a tabletop RPG, is very, very funny to me. Yeah, yeah um, that could be hilarious. 
I didn't realize we were we were ripping off Hans Christian Andersen. Let's call it an homage. Look, if yeah, you I mean, as I often say, if you steal from one person, it's plagiarism. If you steal from a dozen people, it's research. Well, as you've heard, we stole from a number of people already. So, so it counts as we're research. Doing great. We've made a very original work using tons of research. <laughs> very original thoughts. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And when it comes, when it um, when it comes to the when it comes to the collective, um, this is this is also why I asked about the no about the notion of hierarchy about the notion of organization because. Would it be fair to say that there's a degree of hierarchy within it? Or or is it just a series of cells? So within the cosmology of the collective, there's the the man at the head, Lux Hammer Smith. Mm -hmm. um, beyond that, basically, it's his show. So it's more of a... It, for, in terms of this particular organization, at, at the moment, it is Lux Hammersmith and the NPCs who work for him running the thing. And then any supernatural leaning person in New Babylon is a member, whether they want to be, frankly, or not, uh, sometimes. So, so hierarchies like in the, like, uh, the families that are connected and are also, you know, other otherworldly in their powers there are hierarchies within their families probably individually and they might all be members of the collective but um yeah it's lux's show as nick said all right that may that definitely that definitely makes sense um and to and to that end um does the would the collective have certain agents if its um rules are broken i.e. Who, i.e. who's the, who's the one that um who's who's the ones that th that throws the weight if some if somebody decides to break the laws we call them the cleaners uh they serve two functions um if a like if the party in particular does something that would alert normal people to the existence of the supernatural such as it is they go and they clean people's memory, sort of think like men in black in that regard. Mm -hmm. um, they are also in charge of making sure that anybody who breaks the rules is dealt with and dealt with swiftly. Uh, dead or alive or somewhere in between and brought to Lux Hammersmith for judgment. And, I'm ge and based on the way you describe him, I'm guessing Lux Hammersmith is not a man to be fucked with. Certainly not. I haven't decided if I actually want to write stats for him. But yeah, I'd, that that would be a good way to sum it up. Um, I'd say no. Like the, it, yeah, com it comes back to the, it, com it comes back to that whole that whole conundrum of do you stat dragons, as yeah. um as it's been referred to, and I think in the case of someone like Lux, um, maybe 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 down the road if there's an expansion about use about usurping um that seat in the that seat in the collective but for the time being i wouldn't i just say it. Yeah, if somebody tries, if somebody tries to pull a gun on him then that gun probably um blows probably blows up in his face and blinds him, and blinds him or something suitably <laughs> ironic mind yeah for sure he is, a, he is the force that like yeah, is not to be not to be reckoned with in in this world. He's keeping it all in check. Like um, yeah. I suppose the comparison I could make is the Lady of Pain in Planescape. It's been uh, a long time since I've played Planescape. Yeah. Um, Don, you you're um Cyloning really hard. You went all robot-y. Mm -hmm. This is that 2020 mood. Normally we could just do this at my house, but you know. But it's okay. You there, Dom? Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm still, still here. here. Can y'all hear, hear me? You sound like a robot frog. Mm -hmm. Lovely. 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 Give me a <laughs> second. <laughs> well, I did, I, I did promise a shit show. You know... I, it, it it's fitting for the year. Mm -hmm. um, um, now now you guys are set. You guys are setting up to launch Terra's and Tommy Guns on Kickstarter soon. I 
believe it's going to be um, next Tuesday. Yep, Tuesday, September 29th. All right. Um, I'm guessing that Kickstarter is going to run for about 30 days. Yep. So, how many? Um, how many? T- now, Sagas of Midgard um, was a fair, was all things considered a fairly light book. It's it was only 178 pages. Um, how many pages are you shooting for with Terra's and Tommy guns? About the same size, or um, are you shooting for over 200? Um, we'll see where it lands. If I had to guess, I'd probably guess just under 200. Um, it'll probably be a little meatier than Saga's, but um, again, for the kind of stories that we're trying to tell, I feel like if we start padding it down with stat tables and things like that, that we kind of move away from uh, what we're trying to do. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, my guess would be probably about 200 pages. And I can I can go with that. Um, now with that with that in mind, I'll de- now of course I'll definitely be looking forward to seeing how that uh, plays out. But I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the insanity. I, we've been writing a cosmic horror book, man. We love the insanity. Um, I think I think I think Dom didn't roll enough reality checks. Yep, you are you are dissociated, my friend. All right, but you were saying sorry. But any of course, anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. Um, as I often say, drinking is not mandatory around here, but it is encouraged. We'll be sure to get more messed up next time. <laughs> I, from what from what you guys have told have, have told me, that's a recurring experience, especially oh, yeah. since this whole thing started out over beer and pizza. Mm-hmm. I'm hoping you didn't put pineapple on it. No, certainly not. I'm not a monster. Good, <laughs> good. I'd I'd um. I have a very low tolerance for that for that sort of heresy. <laughs> you know, I, I I let people live their life. Just keep it away from me. Far away. Yeah. Um, to be clear, I'm just talking about pineapple on pizza. I love everybody. <laughs> Unless you put pineapple on pizza, I think we're we're it, it's getting to be circular. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um. I. I um. My, I have had a very simple philosophy. I hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are cremated equal. Fair enough. Um, <laughs> That's a good way to think. But, and, but of course, a sincere thanks also goes to everybody who took the time out of their schedule to enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. Yep. Uh, we, yeah, thanks for having us. Dom just texted me, tell him I say bye when the time is right. <laughs> so Dom says bye because the time is right. <laughs> but until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody. <laughs> <laughs>